Hello, welcome to BH215 Behavioral Health Case Management. Today we're going to be talking about promoting a productive work environment. So, one of the major elements of managing any group of people is trying to motivate them. Employees bring different characteristics to an organization. Their demographics, things like their age, their genders, etc., formal education, credentials, and life experiences. However, once they start working at your facility, much of what they do and how they do it will be influenced by the culture of the work environment. As managers, we have a responsibility to take an active shape, active role in shaping the work environment so that the behaviors of staff members are consistent with the goals of the organization and the needs of its clients. <clears throat> so let's start this PowerPoint by looking at motivation. So why do we need to concern ourselves with staff members needs and seeing that they are met to the best degree possible? Because if staff members needs can be met, they are more likely to be good workers, people who provide better services to our clients who are our prime beneficiary. Effective use of the knowledge of motivation is a people skill, certainly an asset for the manager's theories of motivation. So what we're going to look at are the motivational factors that go into being a good manager, because if you're a good manager, you're going to breed good employees. Bad managers breed bad employees. So the better the manager, the better the employees. We're going to start off with Maslow. Now Maslow is one of our more famous um, people who studied motivation and his hierarchy of needs is generally illustrated by a pyramid containing five categories or levels of needs. We're going to start at the bottom which is purple, physiological needs. This is our food, our water, our warmth, and our sleep. Then we have our safety needs which is security and safety. Then we move into the middle, which is belonging and love. This is our intimacy and friends. Then we have esteem, which is our prestige and feelings of accomplishment. And then finally, up at the top, is self-actualization, which is achieving one's full potential, including creative activity. So kind of your Oprah Winfrey moment. The choice of a pyramid to illustrate the various need levels is a reflection of Maslow's belief that many persons find themselves stalled at the first, i.e. physiological needs, fewer are functioning at the second, safety level, fewer yet are at the third level, and so on. In other words, it gets harder as you go up. So, you know, just taking care of our basic needs, that's what we really focus on first. Um, so you can't find self-actualization if you're homeless, in other words. <clears throat> the five levels reflect what Maslow believed were the primary motivators among individuals. In a human services organization, most employees have their most basic needs already met and many, especially the professionals, are motivated by a need for self-actualization. The fifth level, self-actualization, is the highest need level. It involves the use of one's talents, challenges, creativity, and the opportunity for working to one's full potential. People operating at this need level would have met all their lower level needs. Thus, appeals to lower level needs would no longer be motivators for them. So somebody who has food, somewhere nice to live, a partner in life, and respect amongst their peers they're looking to make a difference in the world. They're looking to make changes in the world. They're looking to help people. And so giving them tons more money, giving them um, more vacation, you know, that's not necessarily going to help them. They want to be able to do a better job servicing their clients. Maslow's major contribution was the conclusion that human beings are motivated by unmet needs, specifically by the need above the highest one in the hierarchy that has already been adequately met. 
A satisfied need, according to Maslow, is no longer a motivator. Whenever possible, managers should offer rewards that appeal to workers' current need levels and not to needs that are already met or that they do not yet experience. So looking at this in terms of employee engagement, so if an employee is only there for the money, they are not engaged. They don't care about their job. They're there to clock in. Think about the job you had maybe in high school where you worked at a fast food joint or you folded shirts at the Gap. No offense to the Gap. We love the Gap. But it's not the job you want for your whole life. Then you have the security level. You're not engaged. You're not interested in overtime. You have more sick days than you should. You have poor working conditions. You don't like your manager. You don't like your team. You don't like your job. Um, you are constantly looking for other jobs. So again, that, that level of security is not there. Then you have that third level of belonging. You know you're part of something important. You're almost engaged, but you're not 100% there. You're proud of your work, but you're not necessarily ready to shout it from the rooftops. And you might leave if you're tempted by some career development options that will come down the pike. Then there's importance. And this is when an employee is truly engaged. They feel like they're a vital part of the business. They feel important at work. They are busy and very likely a little bit stressed. They are an achiever. And they would probably leave if something better came along. Then you have your highly engaged person. This is someone who is achieving self-actualization. They are looking what can they do for others? How can they inspire others? They love their jobs and they love the company they work for and they are what they call a high flyer. Someone who has reached this level is committed to their job at the facility where they work and that's what we ultimately want our employees to feel. Moving on we're going to talk about Frederick Hertzberg's two-factor theory and his theories of motivation which were developed in the 1950s and 1960s are based on the belief that most workers tend to be more productive when efforts are implemented to build the potential for self-actualization into their jobs. Hertzberg proposed that for the individual, work contains hygiene factors and motivation factors. Hygiene factors include, for example, high salary, job security, status, good working conditions, or fringe or perks benefits. They are not motivators. They are potential satisfiers, or if they are not present, dissatisfiers. Motivation factors, on the other hand, appeal to the people's need for self-actualization. They include, for example, challenge, interesting work, freedom, responsibility, and potential for growth. Thus, they are factors that are intrinsic to the nature of the work itself. In other words, intrinsic to the sense of the person's need to succeed. Whereas, hygiene factors tend to be more extrinsic. That money, that status, those perks or those fringe benefits. Hertzberg and his colleagues worked with employers and managers to build more motivation factors into their employees' jobs. He called this job enrichment. Sometimes Hertzberg seemed to suggest that motivation factors should be built in even at the expense of hygiene factors. Hertzberg never said hygiene factors were unimportant. They were just not effective motivators. In fact, he believed that the ideal situation exists when both motivation and hygiene factors are present. Then, workers are both highly motivated and satisfied with their jobs. So, job dissatisfaction can be influenced by the hygiene factors of the working conditions, the relationships with coworkers, policies and rules, the quality of the supervisor, and the salary or wage. Job satisfaction, however, is influenced by motivator factors, achievement, recognition, responsibility, the work itself, advancement, and personal growth. 
So we're satisfied by motivators, dissatisfied by hygiene factors. And that's an interesting and important difference to understand. Job enrichment is not very applicable to all staff members in human service organizations. Certain jobs are necessarily dull and repetitive. Hertzberg had other solutions. One of these is job enlargement. It entails a limited expansion of an individual's job responsibilities. A related approach called job rotation entails building variety into a job to relieve boredom and other associated problems. For example, a change of scenery every so often and the opportunity to interact with different people can pro provide relief from the tedium of day-to-day -day responsibilities. So if you are the receptionist for a department that uh, tends to be pretty boring and then you are moved to a different department every month, um, maybe to an emergency um, installation or to a rehab facility or to um, a family-oriented therapy facility and you have a different experience every month it will certainly relieve the tedium. Also if some departments are regarded as harder work or less pleasant than other settings in some way, job rotation also ensures that no one person will be stuck with them more than any other staff members. Then we have David McClellan's needs theory. McClellan's early research suggested that there are basically three different organizational types whose behavior suggests the predominant need that each is attempting to meet. McClellan's theory is an appealing one for social workers who have likely seen clients, co-workers, professionals, relatives, and friends who seem to provide very good examples of each of the three types. According to McClellan, people tend to be motivated by a need for number one, power, number two, affiliation, and number three, achievement. There are people whose behavior seem to reflect the presence of two or more of these needs at different times or in different situations or even simultaneously. So they don't appear in a vacuum and we're not just motivated by one thing through our entire lifetime. People with a strong need for power exhibit the following characteristics. They want to control and influence others. They like to win arguments. They enjoy competition and winning. And they enjoy status and recognition. People with a strong need for affiliation have an approach to human relationships that is almost 180 degrees opposite from that of the power-motivated individual. They want to belong to the group. They want to be liked and will often go along with whatever the rest of the group wants to do. They favor collaboration over competition, and they don't like high risk or uncertainty. Their activities seem to be aimed at being loved and accepted and at avoiding being rejected. Individuals driven by a strong need for achievement display the following characteristics. They have a strong need to set and accomplish challenging goals. They take calculated risks to accomplish their goals. They like to receive regular feedback on their progress and achievements, and they often like to work alone. These individuals crave success, but may never really believe that they have achieved it. They often have some unattainable goal for what is their definition of real success. It guarantees that they inevitably fall short, but they never stop trying to attain it. So people who are achievement driven are really fabulous individuals to have work for you because no matter how much they get done, they always think they can get more done or be more efficient, more effective. Um, it's kind of using their feelings of inadequacy to your advantage. I mean, I know that's a terrible thing to say, but achievement oriented people are usually the hardest workers. Other theories of individual motivation, um, we have Victor Rooms developed the expectancy theory, which resol resolved that organizational behavior is a conscious choice that people make in which they attempt to maximize pleasure and minimize pain and discomfort. Makes perfect sense. 
Vroom suggested that staff members will be motivated to be good workers if they have a strong desire to meet an important need, but only if they believe that good work performance will produce a desirable reward, one that is commensurate with the efforts required to produce it. So if someone who works their butt off does not get the reward that they expected, they will probably no longer work their butt off. However, if on the other hand, somebody who does not work very hard um, is terminated or fired, then that is a clear indication that they are being punished or experiencing pain and discomfort and they want to avoid that. So depending on the circumstances, you can utilize that in terms of what does the person expect based on what they're being told. B.F. Skinner researched the concept of reinforcement and for all of those for those of you who've taken any psychology class you should have learned a little bit about him and this is a tendency to repeat those behaviors that have resulted in positive consequences in the past and to avoid those that have had negative consequences so of course uh, one of B.F. Skinner's most famous um, experiments involved teaching a rat to push, push a lever to get food and every time they pushed a lever and they got a pellet of food, this was a positive reinforcement and they would then push the lever all day, every day, waiting for their food. So moving on, we're now going to talk about other factors that affect job performance. Um, and we're going to start with professional values and ethics. Generally, our professional values serve as positive motivators. That is, they encourage us to do what we believe to be consistent with them. Professional ethics serve more as a constraint or limitation on our behavior. Ethical professionals simply will not do something that their profession has defined as unethical, such as exploiting relationships with clients for their personal gain or using them as research participants without acquiring their voluntary informed consent. So, as part of our jobs, we as professionals, no matter what profession you're in, have a set of ethics and those ethics form the structure in which we follow certain guidelines. And for example, in a school environment, it is always inappropriate for an instructor to have a relationship with their students, a sexual relationship. Um, and, you know, the reality of that is, of course, that when those kind of things happen, there is always doubt. And as such, instructors, professors understand that, and that's why those rules are in place. Another aspect that influences the work group is competition. Some competition promotes a sense of identity and group loyalty in individuals. But, as we have all probably witnessed, excessive comp competitiveness can also result in wasted energy and the absence of desirable teamwork and cooperation. Competition between groups, as long as it remains close, promotes task-oriented behavior, greater structure, and demands for conformity and loyalty within each group. Competition is most likely to generate into non-productive conflict if individuals and groups perceive a situation in which the gain of one is necessarily accompanied by the loss of the other individual or group. And this situation is called a zero-sum game. And I'll explain that in more detail in the next slide. A zero-sum game means, literally, that a situation exists in which the total amount of gain for all individuals involved in the competition must equal zero one side can gain only if others lose the same amount. So take for example a baseball game. The Phillies are playing um, the Yankees. Well if the Phillies win the Yankees lose. If the Yankees win the Phillies lose. Which is usually what happens. Ooh, I didn't say that. Zero-sum games do exist in the workplace. Budgeting situations in homes or in organizations are good examples of zero games. If there is only so much money to spend, spending an amount for one activity means that there is that much less available for another activity. 
in organizations a commitment to the use of merit raises which is dividing a pool of money for salary increases based on recent performance evaluate evaluations results in a zero-sum game if one staff member receives more than his share another will have to get less than her share so for example you have ten thousand dollars to split amongst five employees one employee has been a superstar whereas another employee has been lousy so you give one employee four thousand dollar raise three employees get two thousand dollar raises one employee gets zero raise so that's your ten thousand dollars that you've used up the winner the person who got four grand has that extra two that did not go to the loser who has not been doing a good job another issue you see in work groups is conflict some conflict is not always bad there can always be a benefit to some conflict so for example it can make staff members more involved in activities and less apathetic on the job and can spotlight issues in areas of legitimate professional disagreement unfortunately conflict can also reveal individuals and groups at their worst more concerned with winning an internal struggle than in compromising and or doing what is in the best interests of the organization so when the conflict becomes personal that's when things get really untenable and it does not help the organization at all and as manager your job is to achieve the goals of the organization and not take sides in a conflict so you have to mitigate that conflict group cohesiveness refers to how well a group sticks together and has a unity of purpose members are bound to both other members and to the group understanding cohesiveness and how it varies among work groups is necessary to understanding how group membership impacts on the behavior of staff members work groups can range from uncohesive often with ambiguous boundaries loose structure and no intra-group loyalty to highly cohesive with clear boundaries tight structure and strong intra-group loyalty and as the manager you have a lot to do with creating that cohesiveness loyalties loyalties develop over time with an organization once in place they can become powerful influences on individual and group behaviors loyalties in some form or other are always present within work situations appropriately focused they contribute to organizational goal achievement they can also present major obstacles to goal achievement if they are misplaced so for example if someone is more loyal to their supervisor than to the company and the supervisor leaves they are more likely to follow the supervisor to a new company than stay with the old company and that is when loyalties are misplaced <clears throat> supervision one problem that is frequently encountered in understanding supervision is the different functions that it involves case supervision is based on the recognition that some particularly difficult situations require assistance from a senior professional often one with more experience and or a different perspective and this is a very important issue in behavioral health because you know humans there's not a rule book on if this then this humans don't follow specific patterns they are not you know a plus b equals c they are very unique and as such perspective is very important and if you have a group of people that you work with who can give you their perspectives and their historical experiences that will help you make better decisions Alfred Kedushin first identified behavioral health and social work supervisory roles by dividing the activities of the supervisor into three slightly overlapping activities administrative which is the provision of oversight and accountability for practice development and maintenance of competence and safety system for the service second educational <clears throat> professional and educational development 
reflection on practice, application of theory to practice, foster innovative and creative practice, clarification of role and relationships, clarification of the therapeutic relationship, and increased beneficial outcome for service users. And third, supportive, empowering, encouraging, supportive, managing the emotional effects of the work, providing a safe place to explore ethical and safety issues, managing a wider organization or team issues, promoting job satisfaction, managing stress and preventing burnout, and enhancing welfare and well-being. This provided a workable overview of supervision as a means of both influencing behavior and enhancing growth. So both of those ideas are extremely important in terms of managing in a behavioral health environment. Supportive supervision alleviates the type of job stresses and tensions inherent in the jobs of staff members in many human service organizations, especially in performing tasks of child protection, investigation, or charges of family violence or work with people who have terminal illnesses. With this support, professionals can continue to function well in the job without feeling overwhelmed by the stresses that are characteristic of this type of work. In a human service organization, the supervisor is expected to provide educational supervision, not only by facilitating continuing education for subordinates, but by also serving as a role model and mentor, sharing with them what they know and what they did to grow professionally and succeed in their careers. Administrative supervision involves such important activities as work assignments, task supervision, overseeing, ensuring compliance with rules, policies, and procedures, serving as a buffer between higher level administrators and workers, and matching of workers' competencies to tasks. Your supervisor knows what you're good at, and they know what you're not so good at, so they're going to match your strengths to the tasks that are available. Administrative supervision should be fair and impartial and should be consistent with an appropriate personal standards and practices for high quality and ethical client services. Administrative supervision should also provide both practical assistance and a role model for staff members. Supervisors should stress the need for professionals to base their work on available knowledge, which is evidence-based practice. Alternate supervisory models include the use of preceptors, which provides opportunities for growth of a staff member. What this means is, for example, a social worker in an inpatient mental health setting may be interested in learning more about a certain type of group treatment being offered. The only person who facilitates these groups is a psychologist. In order not to prevent her from having this experience and growth opportunity, the supervisor may ask the psychologist to assume the role of her preceptor, thus delegating part of the task of educational supervision to the psychologist. Obviously, the psychologist would have to agree to take on this role. Secondly, supervision of subordinates in a group. Supervisors may choose to carry out their supervisory activities in a group setting, which can also provide the opportunity for staff members to learn from each other. So those staff meetings that most of us dread and hate are actually very productive. Number three, group supervision, where the line supervisor is present but everyone participates in the supervision of each other, is also sometimes used when staff members are quite experienced and have demonstrated a high level of competence. So for example, in a college setting, a lot of times the professors don't need a manager. They manage themselves, but they come together to discuss issues that are going on so that they can come to uh, determinations and decisions that they all agree on. Number four, multidisciplinary supervision. Case consultation from various disciplines such as medicine, psychology, nursing, occupational therapy, and social work. Supervisors benefit from the opportunity to learn from those in other disciplines. Finally, remote supervision. 
Many social workers find themselves working in small organizations or in rural areas where there is no possibility of having an on-site supervisor who has the necessary professional credentials. However, this doesn't mean that decisions must be made unilaterally or that help can't be obtained. Supervision of professional staff can and sometimes does come through regular or sporadic email and voice messaging or by using Skype with more experienced peers within or outside the organization. So for example, in a state like Wyoming, which has a very small population, you're not going to see the numbers of facilities that you would see in a state like New Jersey, which is the most densely populated state. They're going to, in Wyoming, rely much more on remote supervision, whereas in New Jersey, you can't swing a cat without hitting a supervisor. So, that's it for today. If you have any questions, please email or text me. If you are not in my class but still have a question, please leave me a comment and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you and have a fabulous day.